Hi there, good afternoon. How's it going? Today is July 3rd, 2024. Happy 4th of July. Also, happy Canada Day. That was on July 1st. To all my fellow Canadians, I was born in Vancouver but raised in Northern California, a few hours away from where I am now. So, this is not the Rainbow Gathering. This is Shasta Trinity. National Forest. My Honda CRV parked right down there. I am staying at a campground not too far away here on the Long Canyon Trail, Wilderness Boundary, three quarter miles, Bowerman Meadow 2, Deer Creek Pass 5, Stewart Fork Trail 12. I am obviously doing a day hike, not uh, planning to camp overnight. My tent is set up back at my uh, campsite there. So, much has transpired since my last video, which was filmed more than a week ago in Mendocino County, Northern California. In that video, then I talked about how I was planning to uh, go to the Rainbow Gathering, and yes, I did go, but I only spent one night there. Arrived on June 30th, left the next morning on July 1st. I did not leave because it was a terrible experience, but I did leave because it was a less than ideal experience. But I will get to that in a few minutes. I want to quickly catch you guys up, those who uh, follow the channel, with uh, where I've been since my last video. So, from uh, the Eel River there. So, I drove from the Eel River down to Ukiah, where my mom and stepdad live. Stayed there for just two nights, and then drove down to uh, Santa Rosa, California, home of Charles Schultz, the uh, comic strip creator of the famous Peanuts comic strip, Charlie Brown and Peppermint Patty and Snoopy and all that. My aunt lives there. She recently broke her ankle, unfortunately, and was in a care home. So I stayed at her house and then visited her in her care home a couple of times. So I stayed there for two nights and then uh, left. And as I mentioned, I had a dental appointment in Ukiah, where my mom lives. So I uh, drove from Santa Rosa to Ukiah, got my dental appointment done. And so from there, I drove over to Nevada City on the way to Reno to visit my brother, his wife, and their son. 
So I uh, stayed in a hotel in Nevada City the next day, drove to Reno, visited my father, who was in a care home there, and then went to my brother's house and stayed there for the next three nights. And then from there, I was planning to go to the, finally getting around to the uh, topic of this video, the Rainbow Gathering, which was outside of Janesville. However, I got a text message from my mom saying, it's on the news that the police are shutting down the gathering and kicking everyone out. And so I looked online and confirmed, sure enough, that was happening. They were blocking traffic going in, only allowing people to go out, and they were threatening a $5,000 fine and up to six months imprisonment for anyone who didn't obey the order and leave the site. So I didn't want to get involved in that. No point in it. Drive out there and then there would just be a roadblock and they would say, go away. So I was accepting the idea that Rainbow is over for this year, not going to happen. And I would just continue with my plans to go camping and backpacking. But there is a rainbow motto, which is ignore all rumors of cancellation. So the rainbow gathering seemed to be canceled, but was it really? So maybe a day later, after learning that the police were shutting it down, I was doing more research online and discovered that the site had been changed to just north of Beckworth. So they are there right now. The official dates of the Rainbow Gathering are July 1st through 7th. And so it is right in the middle of it. Now, July 4th is the peak day in which the uh, people gather in silence in the meadow in the morning and then a parade of children comes down into the meadow, breaks the silence, and then everyone starts drumming and dancing, and it's basically a drum circle dance party all day, all night. So I discovered that there was another site designated just north of Beckworth, which was actually closer to Reno than where it had been outside of Janesville. And so I decided, okay, yeah, let's go ahead and do it, check it out. I didn't have high expectations. I had read online that uh, there was a fire ban, so no fire for the uh, drum circle, no campfires at all. All of the food had to be heated by gas stoves. And because of the last minute change of location, then it was probably going to be a rather disorganized situation. But I wanted to go. I have been to 13 rainbow gatherings since my first one in summer of 1993, the uh, Oregon Regional Gathering. And then my first big national one was in summer of 1994 in Wyoming, where, as I discussed in my book, Kundalini and the Art of Being, there was a forest fire there. I'm not sure if it was accidentally started by somebody at the Rainbow Gathering. I forget if that was ever determined or not. But the uh, Forest Service found out about it and they flew over with, you know, aircraft carrying liquid. I don't know if it was just water or something you know, else with some sort of a, uh, you know, flame resistant thing in it or what. But uh, anyways, they flew over. We saw the plane go over the gathering. They dropped it on the fire, more or less. They did it again. It did not put out the fire. And then that was it. The uh, Forest Service was too busy dealing with other bigger fires elsewhere. It was a big fire year that uh, summer of 1994. And so we have a forest fire going on 
at the gathering, not like right in the middle, but kind of more on the edge. And we put it out. I helped with the uh, firefighting. Never saw like big flames, but the uh, charred area, smoke coming out of the ground, you know, little flames here and there, left over from where it had come through earlier. And so we organized and uh, had buckets of water and shovels and whatever anyone had to uh, help fight the fire and eventually we put it out. So that leads into why the police were deciding to shut down the uh, gathering because of fire concerns, environmental damage, drug use, people, you know, maybe causing problems in the local town, and also a Native American burial site that was kind of on the edge of the gathering site. Now, these are all valid concerns, every one of them, but it is nothing new for the Rainbow Gathering family since they first began in 1972, the year that I was born. So, 52 years of Rainbow Gatherings, and they have always worked. Even when there was a forest fire, we put it out. So, the official dates are July 1st through 7th, but uh, people start arriving much uh, sooner than that. So, the directions were announced to the site, the original site, on, I think, June 18th, 17th or 18th. And so once those directions are announced, anybody can head out there and help with the setup of the site. There's no delineation between the people setting it up, organizing it, and the participants. There are no leaders. Oh, I forgot to mention also the refusal on the part of the uh, Rainbow Gathering people to get a permit for the gathering. And so I will address all of these. These uh, gatherings have been happening for 52 years and all of these, you know, possible problems have come up and are an issue at uh, pretty much every one of them to some extent except the Native American burial site situation, although I think that that has been an issue at previous gatherings as well. But uh, let's go with the... Uh, fire permit situation first, because as I was just saying, then there's no leader. There's no even group of leaders. There are people who take on more responsibility, who find the site, who get there first, start setting up, and it could be considered sort of de facto leaders, but still, they're not official leaders. So anybody can show up as soon as the site directions are announced and get there and help out with the cleanup. I mean the setup and also the cleanup afterwards and uh, help set up kitchens because it is all free, run on donations. People bring all of the necessary equipment for the kitchens and latrines, etc. They bring the supplies, stuff to uh, set up a kitchen in the woods, but uh, using just very basic supplies, mostly like the down wood, like, you know, that uh, log right there would be great for using as a support beam or whatever for a structure. You aren't allowed to like cut down trees or tear down limbs. I mean, a little limb is no big deal, but uh, you don't go around cutting up the trees in order to get wood for building structures or for the fires. And so it is a very kind of a casual event, although it is not small. The uh, biggest ones, which is the U.S. annual national rainbow gathering, which occurs every summer in a different location. Okay, here we have a little uh, creek. Must not be the one that I read about that said you would have to walk through it. 
just a uh, stream here. So I have a, a bottle of water in the backpack here. I have two raspberry lemonades. I also have water treatment purifying stuff so that if I finish off the water, I can fill up the uh, bottle again and have fresh water that is treated. And then I also have my rain jackets, some uh, food, and uh, a few other things in the uh, little day pack here. So, people start showing up and setting up the gathering. It is... You could say a hippie festival, but it is kind of more than a festival and different from a festival. There are no musical acts other than just people showing up with their guitars and drums. The drum circle, there's often a, uh, I think pretty much every time, a uh, talent stage set up where people can, you know, make music, put on a play, whatever. Again, just built from the wood lying around. And so it is very different from, you know, Burning Man, this hyper-organized thing. You have to buy tickets and uh, bring all of your supplies, including food. Whereas you can just show up at the uh, Rainbow Gathering with nothing penniless and walk right in and get free food for as long as you're there, which for many people is several weeks, one, two, three, maybe even four weeks. However, the uh, gathering is supported by donations, and so at every meal, circle, then there's what is called the magic hat passed around, or they uh, usually walk around a little group playing music, singing a little song about the magic hat, and then people put in whatever money they choose to. And then those go out to the kitchens, the uh, cash, so that they can buy more food and other supplies. All right, so I guess I've walked three quarters of a mile, because that's what it said to the boundary line, Trinity Alps Wilderness, Shasta Trinity National Forest. So, Alps, the Trinity Alps, I have been here before. The last time that I can remember was, yeah, I'm pretty sure that would have been the last time. In 2002, I graduated from Humboldt State University. Now it's called like Cal Polytechnic Humboldt or something fancy sounding. But uh, graduated from Humboldt with a BA in World Religions. I wanted to get a degree in uh, creative writing which is what I had studied when I was in Alaska, going to the University of Alaska, Fairbanks, and Juneau for a year each. Okay, another pretty beautiful little creek here. All right, I think I will uh, stop, splash some water on my face, and get the uh, hat wet, and uh, yeah, maybe the uh, tank top as well. Actually, you know what? It's coming off. Heating up here. So it looks like that is the larger creek that I will probably be crossing at some point here. The uh, total mileage of this hike, I think is around like three miles one way up to Lake Anna, so six miles round trip. So I didn't finish addressing all of the uh, issues that uh, can come up and are the reason cited by the police in Susanville the uh, larger town near uh, Janesville, close to the site, as to why they decided to uh, shut it down and threaten fines and possible jail time for people who stayed. So, permits. I don't know the exact rules as far as gatherings in uh, National Forest. The rainbow gatherings are always held in National Forest where anybody can camp for free for up to 14 days. But uh, probably it is an official rule that 
permits are required for gatherings of more than, you know, 15, 20 people, something like that. And the rainbow gatherings can have 10, 20, 30,000 people in the woods there. So legitimate concern of environmental, you know, effects. But uh, as I was discussing, there are no official leaders, and so there is nobody who can have the authority to sign a camping permit. Now, of course, somebody could, but uh, it is part of the principle of the gatherings that there are no leaders. No one person can speak for everybody else. No one person can sign a permit. And they are based on the constitutional right of freedom of assembly. And I totally recognize that, you know, there should be limits on freedom of assembly. For example, to attempt to take over the Capitol. You know, that is not covered under the constitutional right to assemble, to, you know, engage in riots, violence, etc to try to take over the government or for any other purpose if uh, violence is involved and for other reasons as well including concerns about environmental you know damage of our beautiful forests here in the United States but as I said these gatherings have been successful for more than 50 years based around these principles and yes it is a little bit of a rebellion to not get the permit, to just pick a site and go. But uh, that is a rule that is worth breaking in my opinion and the opinion of many others. It is about camping. It is not for any nefarious reason. It is just about camping. And if there had to be this advanced organized effort to find the right spot in coordination with, you know, authorities and get the proper permits etc that would just put a whole other you know level of bureaucracy and and it would kind of affect the gatherings in some way for some specific person to be the you know guy in charge signing the permit and negotiating with the police etc so i understand some people might disagree with that conduct on the part of the rainbow gathering family to not get the permit, but that's the way it is, it works, and people stay and clean up the site. People arrive early to set up the site, people stay after the 7th of July to clean up the site, and I have been to sites, the same site more than once, in which I was there and realized, oh, this is where the site was, you know, a few years ago, and it was all, you know, perfect, looking natural, no garbage or anything. That's not to say that there aren't instances in which sometimes people don't properly clean up afterwards, and if that happens, that's a shame. But uh, for the most part then, they clean up and restore the site as well as they can back to its original state. Of course, it can't be exactly the same, but forests are resilient as far as growing back, etc. The grass and whatnot, and uh, there isn't major, you know, damage to the site as far as, as I said, toppling trees, building structures out of plastic that they leave behind or whatever. You know, it is, it is not impacted greatly, of course. There can be garbage left behind and that is generally dealt with. So that addresses the environmental concern you know, it's not perfect, and sometimes it probably should have been done better, but these gatherings are a great source of community and the opportunity for people to get away from the modern technological world. Get away from the internet, get away from roads, traffic lights, the noise of the city, experience nature, one of my favorite things in the world, getting into the woods and uh, come together and, and meet new people and have a different kind of experience. And so 
it is worth the occasional, you know, mistakes on the part of some rainbow gathering participants that don't, you know, properly clean up, etc. So drug use. First of all, weed is legal in California, so no problem with that anymore. And of course in many other states, like every state along the uh, Pacific Ocean, California, Oregon, Washington, I forget if Nevada is, certainly Utah is not, but I went to the gathering the last time in 2014 in Utah. Certainly there was, you know, pot smoking going on there. But one very important uh, rule, one of the few rules, is no alcohol is allowed. And so uh, that takes away a big problem as far as both people getting belligerent, stupid, mean, etc. More likely to get in fights and all this, and takes away the environmental impact of beer cans and broken bottles being left around. So there is a camp on the edge of the gathering site, alcohol camp, where alcohol is allowed and it is constricted to there. But elsewhere throughout the site, if you break open a beer, someone will tell you that's not allowed. And I totally agree with that rule. As for everything else, you know, it's other people's choices, their risk to take, that reminds me a really sad uh, story. When I was at the gathering in 2014 in Utah, now was it that gathering or was it the previous one that I went to which was in 2008 in, I think, Wyoming? Now I forget, I think at 2014 gathering. Anyways, I got into my car, I come back, the gatherings are held, away from where all the cars are parked, usually, you know, half a mile to a mile or something of a hike. And so I go to my car to get something, am hiking back, and I hear sort of this yelling, and coming up the trail towards me is a young woman who is, I think, handcuffed, police on either side of her, and she's like, yelling, let me go, stuff like this. I don't know what happened, but very likely they caught her doing drugs. And as she passes me, she says something to me. I forget. I forget what she said, but, uh, you know, there was nothing that I could do. She said something, something, brother, something like... I don't think she said, like, help me, I forget, but, uh, anyways, Utah has very strict drug uh, laws. She could have been in jail for who knows how long for smoking a joint or whatever, which I, you know, think shouldn't be criminalized, and I'm glad that it is being decriminalized around the world especially across the U.S. But uh, as for other stuff, hard stuff, you know, that's not my thing. And it's on other people's, you know, conscience or whatever, what they're doing in their tents by themselves. So, yes, it does happen. Uh, as it happens in many towns. You don't shut the town down because some people are drug addicts or whatever. And so, uh, I think that pretty much addresses the issues, the fire issue. Oh, so no personal campfires are allowed. As I said, there was a fire ban, and so no fires whatsoever at either of the gathering sites, the old one or the new one, this year. But when fires are allowed, then only group camps, like if you have a group of people, more than just a couple people, then you could have a campfire there the drum circle fires, the fires at the kitchens for cooking food, etc. But all of the fires must have a bucket of water and a shovel right nearby. People are fire aware and 
fires have not been a serious problem other than the one that I mentioned at the uh, 94 gathering in Wyoming. So that addresses all of the concerns that were brought up by the police, except the Native American burial site. So I ended up talking with a guy who had been at the original site, and he said that the Native American burial site was somewhere way out at the uh, edge of the uh, gathering, a small little area which could have easily been roped off or something, and certainly, you know, most likely that would have been respected. I don't know what was there, you know. They didn't have, you know, tombstones, right? So there probably was very little there. It was maybe just kind of a spot that was known by the Native American people. So that's a trickier one. You know, what do you do about that? You can rope it off, put up signs, don't enter. Native American burial location, no camping, no walking through here, whatever. But that is a little bit of a uh, trickier one if the local Native American people are saying, we don't want you here because of this burial site, then uh, that's a tougher one to uh, sort of come to a determination on. But that was one of the factors involved in why the police shut it down. So, finally getting to my experience here, after like 30 minutes of talking or whatever, but uh, I wanted to give information, you know, not everybody knows what a rainbow gathering is, what is the, you know, protocol, how does it work, etc. And so, I'm in Reno, and I now have the directions for the new site, north of Beckworth. Beckworth is barely a town, about an hour's drive from Reno. So, I take off on the afternoon of June 30th. The official start day is July 1st, the next day. And so, at this point then, usually, it would be fully up and running. You would arrive there, park, take your tent, etc., your backpack of stuff, and start hiking to the uh, gathering site down a trail, and then generally come across a sign, a beautifully painted sign, a map of the gathering site, maybe with some, you know, rules as well, no personal fires, no alcohol, etc. And then there would be a long list of all of the kitchens that had been set up over the previous, you know, week to 10 days. The names and locations on the map, so that if you wanted to find a friend who was, you know, involved in such and such kitchen, what is there, like granola funk, and aloha camp, and the Hare Krishnas, and uh, what else? Maybe I'll think of a few other names of some of the uh, camps slash kitchens. And so, you come to the sign, and it would be a, you know, welcome home, is one of the uh, expressions there. Welcome home. And uh, colorfully painted map of the site. And then you keep on walking and get to the uh, main meadow. Usually a very big uh, meadow, very beautiful, surrounded by trees, grassy, good for doing yoga in, sitting down, talking, hanging out, and having the uh, breakfast and dinner circles where everyone forms a big circle and uh, you maybe say some prayers, do a group om, and then the kitchens bring down the uh, food and start serving everybody. And the magic hat goes around. You can also find food at many of the kitchens directly. They'll just cook up, you know, whatever. Pizza, beans, soup, pancakes, popcorn, tea. Nick at night is one. Nicotine at night. And they have like various tobacco types. Cookies, whatever. And anywhere that is serving, they just yell, serving or whatever. And then anybody can line up and uh, get fed there. And so you can just wander around the uh, 
gathering to the different kitchens, find, you know, music, people playing guitars around a campfire or in a meadow, and be involved in anywhere, including helping out in the kitchens. I was planning to uh, help collect firewood for the uh, drum circle, but that ended up being, you know, irrelevant. Or dig a latrine. I like those kind of just straightforward, just like grunt, you know, dig away, grab wood, kind of do it on your own, rather than being involved in a kitchen, organized, you gotta do this, yada yada. I mean, that can be fun too, but uh, anyways. So, I drive out there, got the directions, and it was easy to find, not too far, only like a uh, 20 minute drive outside of uh, Beckworth there. Pull up at the site with low expectations because I know that, you know, all the kitchens had to shut down at the other site. So, the uh, site was far enough away from the uh, other site that the Susanville police were not involved, and so there was some other police department there, but they were just monitoring things and cooperating with the uh, Rainbow family, helping with the parking, showing where to park, where not to park, which is usually how it goes, is the police, even if they don't like the idea at the beginning, then pretty much every other time, as far as I know, this is the only time that uh, the uh, gathering has been uh, shut down by the police. Maybe there was another time or two, but uh, there are police there driving up and down the road. I saw a fire truck and they're all just, you know, watching things, making sure that it all goes smoothly. So I uh, get a nice uh, welcome home from a guy on the side of the road who is, uh, you know, helping people arriving telling people where to park and where the uh, trail is to the main meadow. And so I go and park and then take out my tent and uh, just go walking to the site with my little backpack like this and my tent to find a spot to camp without carrying all my stuff. And then we'll come back and get uh, the essentials later. So. There are not many people there. There are quite a few cars lined up on the side of the roads. You know, dozens of cars. But uh, walking around the site, there's almost nobody. Just a few tents here and there. A few people wandering around. But uh, the site had just changed, like, the day before, maybe two days before. And so the kitchens hadn't arrived and started setting up again. I think maybe one or two had, or at least there was food cooked for the circle that night. But I didn't see a single other kitchen, you know, all set up and ready to go. There was no welcome sign with the map and all that. So it was really very, very like preliminary stages. And the next day was the first official day. Also, the site was just really unsatisfactory. It was very rocky, very dusty, yet also with tons of uh, grass with the little, you know, things that get stuck in your shoes and shorts and socks, etc. Okay, B Tree Gap, 3.4, so 3.4 miles, and then Bowerman Meadows. So, I do have a, a map of the entire Trinity Alps here in my backpack. So I'm going to take that out. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to Bowerman Meadows to get to Lake Anna, but I uh, definitely want to confirm that. Simply Lemonade with raspberry. All natural. Oh yeah, that is what I'm talking about. Not sponsored, but uh, Simply Lemonade, whoever makes this, call me. Just kidding. I don't do ads on my uh, videos. Mm. Oh man, that is amazing. Okay, still gotta check the map. So yes, I am going to Bowerman Meadows and at this point, I am about halfway to Lake Anna. So a uh, perfect uh, day hike that seemed like about a mile and a half. 
at this point. So six miles round trip and there is the bigger creek. Looks like this is probably where I will be uh, having to uh, take off the sandals and uh, walk through it. So I'm going to wrap this up now and you're probably getting the idea why I only stayed uh, one night there. So it's just a uh, less than ideal site, totally not ready for the uh, gathering. It will happen for sure, you know, they'll get it set up. I find a spot to set up my tent under a tree, a decent enough uh, spot, but you know, it's all the rocks around and uh, um, just tons of these kind of prickly, you know, grasses and stuff like this. And so then I head back to my car, get other stuff and bring it there. My camping mattress, my sleeping bag, etc. It's up in elevation so it's going to get chilly at night. And uh, get everything all set up and then pretty much by that time it is about time for the uh, dinner circle. I hear them uh, yelling from the uh, meadow. Also the main meadow is just, you know, it's okay but uh, it's a little bit small, rocky. You know, there have been much, uh, much better locations. So I uh, walk over to the uh, meadow and the circle with uh, my metal cup or something like that, or a little pan to uh, collect the food in, and a uh, spoon and fork, which is in fact in my uh, backpack at all times. Pick a random spot, take a seat next to a couple people, end up talking with uh, the guy next to me, who is the guy who told me about the Native American burial site back at the old site, because he had been at the original site for like, seven or ten days, one of the uh, first people helping set up, and he said, man, that site was just so much better that it was a, like a really nice, gorgeous, pretty site, so it's an all-around shame that the uh, police shut it down because it happened anyway, and it's just not going to be nearly as nice of a gathering. I'm sure a lot of people will have abandoned, including a lot of the uh, kitchens, and so less people and not a great uh, location. But uh, have a nice uh, conversation with that guy there. And uh, then the uh, Magic Hat musical troupe comes through with, uh, I think it was actually a hat. Sometimes it's just like, you know, I don't know, some sort of bag or whatever. And they're collecting donations. There was like six people, part of the uh, little musical band, going around with the uh, hat. And uh, so they um, go around the circle and then anyone who has cash puts it in there. And then the food comes around, but there is very, very little food. Um, enough, I actually got full. But uh, usually there's like, you know, overflow. You can get like half a dozen different things. I got some macaroni that uh, had some really good, like a curry spicy sauce to it. So that was quite good. And then uh, some rice. And, oh no, no, the curry was not on the macaroni. The macaroni was like tomato sauce, you know, kind of a little bit of sauce, but it was, it was all right. And then there was this like vegetable mix, like kind of boiled vegetables with the um, curry sauce. It was really quite tasty and then some plain rice. So that was it. But oftentimes they just like keep on coming with all kinds of different uh, things. And so I had a nice dinner there, a nice uh, conversation with a few different people there. And then after that is over, then I hear the uh, drum starting up over the drum circle. There's no fire. So uh, I brought my drum with me, little djembe drum that I bought in Varanasi, India back on my first trip to India in 1999 to 2000. So this was towards the end of my trip in like January of uh, 2000, maybe February. Yeah, probably February because I was headed back north to uh, Delhi to catch my flight. I go back to my tent, get my little drum, and uh, go over to the drum circle, so no fire. There is a little lantern, I'm not sure, it must have been electric, in the middle, sort of hanging on top of these uh, little branches, things set up, so that it's sort of kind of lighting people up a little bit, better than nothing. And uh, people are drumming, and I start drumming, and have a nice, uh, like, several hours of just um, drumming away. I'm no musician, but uh, I've learned to drum at the Rainbow Gatherings and uh, really like it. And so had a nice uh, few hours and then go back to my tent, sleep. It was pretty chilly that night. And then, uh, man, the uh, arm is getting tired. You know I've been going for a long time when my arm gets tired because usually 
I don't have to switch hands. And so, by that point, I was pretty much thinking, yeah, I think I will probably take off tomorrow because I was especially looking forward to this. This was the plan after the gathering, was uh, getting out into the woods, into real nature, without thousands of people around. And so I wake up in the morning and there are people yelling, like all over the place, like not like, you know, distress, not emergency, just, seems like there's almost always people yelling somewhere, but it was especially persistent. I sleep with earplugs, so managed to kind of sleep through it, but then, you know, started to hear it. And it's early, man, it is like six o'clock or something, and off in the distance, a ways away, not around me, there was one little group of people that uh, set up right near me, and they had dogs right after I had set up my tent. I was thinking I was the only one there, and then these people came along, but they weren't loud, and the dogs didn't even make much noise. But uh, I hear these people yelling off in the distance, and that was kind of the final straw for me. Like, I want to wake up and hear the wind in the trees, maybe a creek or whatever, not, uh, you know, people yelling all over the place. So, uh, I hang about for a little while longer, you know, take my time that morning and then finally get rolling. Pack up my uh, tent, take my stuff back to the car and cruise in this direction and uh, drove to Weaverville that day, which was day before yesterday. Got a hotel room for the night in Weaverville to get my plans figured out for coming up here, where to camp, where to hike, etc. Weaverville is the town that is 30 minutes drive from my campground where I'm staying. And so next day, then, drove up here. There were several different campgrounds along the way, checked them all out, found the one that I liked the most, and set up my tent there last night. And then uh, I didn't uh, have dinner at the uh, campground. I drove back into town since it's only 30 minutes and went to a Mexican restaurant last night and then came back and then had, uh, you know, snacks and breakfast stuff, etc. here to have uh, today. So there you go. That gets to today. Here I am in the Trinity Alp, loving it, and going to end the video here. So if you're thinking, hey, come on, all you showed us was a bunch of trees and a couple of creeks, what about Lake Anna? I will show Lake Anna in another video. Going to make another one, probably a lot shorter, about the Trinity Alp and uh, showing the lake and more of whatever I see. They're called the Alps for a reason. They're spectacular. I'm not getting that far up into them. Here, we'll see uh, what it looks like. But uh, um, this is a really, really special spot away from the main touristy places. I mean, still, you know, tourist campers, etc. come up here. But uh, it's not like the Sierras, Yosemite National Park, Tuolumne Meadows, Tioga Pass, all that, where it is just like mobbed with uh, campers. It is a kind of out of the way spot here. And the Marble Mountains, which I'm sure that some of you know from my previous videos, having uh, filmed videos there three times now, 2012, 2016, 2020. It's become a four year tradition to go to the Marble Mountains. Here it is four years later, 2024. And I will very likely go there next after exploring the Trinities for a few days. We shall see. But uh, anyways, more coming from the beautiful Trinity Alps in the next video. Time to get across this creek. It is gonna feel good to put the feet in that water.